This week's episodes were brought to you by Snoopy. Hey, you folks, Quilly Teen here, and welcome to another episode of our Project Mighty Spud, our Unity uh, endeavor here to build a sort of a space slash ground terrain engine. Last episode, we did add the ability to swap from space to ground based on the coordinates of our ship over here. But we are going to, well, first of all, there's a couple of things we need to finish. After the we do the swap to terrain mode, we need to reset the position of the ship. Two things, we need to reset the position of the ship um, and its rotation, as well as a camera, if there's a camera attached to the actual ship over here, uh, which I guess there's not, but there, there probably could and slash should be, uh, we need to reset those because the the viewpoint of these objects doesn't don't match up. So we actually could really emphasize that if we take the main camera and attach it inside the ship and then set the main camera to literally be linked to the ship here. Uh, let me just do this, 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 move the camera slightly above and behind the ship. There we are. There we go. So there's the spaceship over here. So the camera is attached to that, right like that. Um, is it facing the right way? I'm trying to think what that means for the ship's facing. Well, yeah, I guess it's, it's normally facing positive. So right now the ship is facing away. But what we'll want to do then is rotate the ship around uh, 180 degrees. Sorry, 180. There we go. So now the ship is facing towards the planet. Okay. Um, and we are coming in for a landing. And then the big thing is, again, if we hit play and we hit land ship, A, the ship isn't in the right position, but also it's facing the wrong way. It should be facing downwards like we just were, but it's not. It's facing uh, along, uh, I guess, negative Z at this point. So it's facing the wrong way. So what we, just, what we have to do is rotate this around the origin effectively, right? Imagine the situation where we put, what's the best way to do this? Let's create an empty at zero, zero, zero. Okay, we're going to put the ship inside that. But it's not how we're going to implement it, but it's good for visualizing here. And if we rotate, what we're looking to do is we're rotating the ship like so. So now the ship is correctly positioned above the planet um, and looking downwards. Although we can't really tell that because the far clipping plane is too short. There we go. So something like that. All right. So that's what we're doing is we're going to be rotating the ship a 90 degrees negative X which should fix our coordinate system. Well, it fixes it now. It doesn't fix it from every origin point. It's, ah, or does it? Maybe it does. All right, well, let's, let's figure that out. So now we've landed, we're going to move the ship to be in the same reference system. So what we're going to do is we're going to tell the ship dot transform dot rotate around. So we want to rotate around the origin. So vector three dot zero. We want to choose an axis. We are going to rotate it around the positive x axis, uh, which we could just say something like vector three dot right. Okay, that's the positive x axis. And then we want to rotate it negative 90 degrees. So rotate the ship uh, negative 90 around the x axis. So now, um, and I'm going to preemptive, I'm going to change the camera here to give it a far clipping plane. There we go. So if we hit play and we land the ship, boom, the ship has been rotated. So it's facing down on the planet exactly in the right way. Um, the downside is we do still have to fix the scale because everything was shrunk down like unbelievably. So uh, radius of moon is 1737 kilometers, right? So, and that's double. So this is the diameter move. So what we have to do after we land is we have to multiply the ship's scale and distance by a thousand. So if we go in here, uh, so we rotate, then um, we need to multiply the ship. Um, so in space, one unit equals one kilometer. On ground, one unit equals one meter. Metric system is good. So mult uh, scales distance by 1,000. 
Now, here's the thing that I'm going to complain about in Unity here. I don't know why um, we can't multiply vectors. So, like, vector 3 position is equal to uh, the ship dot transform dot position. Why can't we multiply a vector by a scalar? I don't think it lets us do this, right? Or am I dreaming? Maybe it is allowed? I thought it didn't. No, I guess it does. Okay, never mind. Uh, so we can actually save this. Now, the thing, we can't change the position directly, but we can do this and then set it to the new position. For some reason, I thought the vectors didn't let you do that. I might be thinking of something else. Or maybe you can't do it the other way around. Maybe it's if you have a thousand. That's probably it. Maybe that's what I've tried, and that's why I'm confused. So that's one. And then we also have to do the same thing for the scale. So scale of the ship, because we have to embiggen the ship. Uh, so that's local scale, multiply it by a thousand, and then we're going to set the scale to scale. So now we're going to hit play. Well, let it compile. Land ship. And now we should be really high above the surface. In fact, we're so far, we're beyond the clipping plane, which is okay, because we're actually trying to land... Are we landing from too far away? Hmm. Uh... Oh, 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 wait, 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 can I wait some more? Uh, we are forgetting to subtract... Um... But... You know, we'll do that first. Let's not do the multiplication first. Because I think it'll be a little bit cleaner. Position times 1,000. There we go. And then we'll do the scale. Um, subtract the radius of the planet, toid, uh, which is the scale. So if we do um, position is equal to position minus the planetoid dot transform dot local scale, I guess. Uh, divided by 2. Because the scale is reporting the diameter based on our current system, not the radius. Right? Because if we look at the planet, it's got the 3,000 and change instead of the, the 1,700 and change. So we take that local scale, divide it by 2, and that's a vector 3, so we subtract the position from that. Now we get a number that's a lot smaller than before. So now when we land, we are 8,000 units. So we're 8 kilometers above the surface of the ground. Um, and and the totally wrong Z. Oh, derp, 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 derp. No. Right, hold on. Um, uh, ooh, this is wrong. Yes. Um, ooh, ah, ooh, ah. Huh. Yeah, because I'm subtracting all the numbers. So at this point, pause is like 0, 0, 5,000. Or, well, it's not 5,000 because we're a lot closer. It's 0, 0, some number. But here we're subtracting 1,700, comma, 1,700, comma, 1,700, which we can't do. Uh, do we just change the magnitude? Pop, pop? I think so, actually. Um, float uh, planet radius is equal to this dot magnitude. I mean, really, we could just look at anything, but, you know, some axis, which would be faster. I guess that's fine. Divided by two. Pick any one axis of the scale. They'll all be scaled in exactly the same way. So that is the planet's radius. So now what we need to do is set the um, uh, magnitude. It's read only, that's right. So the position, we want the position dot normalized multiplied by the planet radius. Uh, sorry, no. Um, we want to take its old magnitude, position dot magnitude. We want to subtract the planet's radius. This will tell us how far above the surface we're supposed to be. 
Because if we, if our magnitude defined a vector that was 1745 and the planet radius is 1700, then this will leave us a 45. This would still be in kilometers at this point, note. So then the normalized one this becomes a unit vector. So then it's the unit vector multiplied by 45. So now we have a position that would be 45 kilometers multiplied by 1,000. So now it's 45,000 meters. Um, and then we fix the scale. Okay, let's try that. We're actually much closer than 45 because the radius is very close. We're actually just like, I guess we're about 8 kilometers above the surface is what should happen. Something like that. So hit play. First of all, where's the moon? Land ship. Excellent. That's perfect. So now our ship is, yeah, eight kilometers above the surface of the ground, facing straight down towards there. That's exactly what we're looking for. Now, obviously, you don't want this thing where you see the emptiness, which is why when you actually approach, you're going to have to decide some distance that you actually change to terrain mode. I mean, at this point, we're still 1,500 meters above the ground, 1.5 kilometers above the ground. Um, so there's that. I think maybe we would make the chunks a little bit bigger or something. I don't know. Like, that that's a question of tuning. When do you actually... And normally, of course, you wouldn't have a button to land. What we would do, instead of having a button to land the ship, is you would have code that when the ship gets close enough, so not here, but when it gets, you know, this close then we're going to initiate the landing function. Same thing for the inverse here, which is when we are, uh, wow, that is, that is really big, hold on. So 1737, so if I set this to 1738, then when I hit the land ship button, it's black because we're just looking at that equator line, I should be one kilometer above the surface of the moon. Boom. There we go. That looks good. All right. So yes, we were one we were one kilometer above the surface of the moon, and now we're still one kilometer over the surface of the moon, in a uh, but in a different um, coordinate system. Things got scaled, so our ship should be relatively the same the way it was before. That's great. That is really good. Uh, one of the things that we haven't really done is the moon here is a very simple object without a custom shader, and really that's not the way we're going to want to do it. The moon's material over here, we actually want to use our topography here as like a height map instead of a texture map. And we almost want to put like this ground texture as the albedo. You know what I'm saying? Right? Like, and then you do get, um, there's like normals. I mean, it's not a normal map. You can sort of halfway fake it, but not really. Uh, if we took this test topography and we duplicated it, which is a big image, so it's taking a while. And then we turn this into a normal map, which again, isn't actually accurate but it'll give us some amount of bumpiness kind of thing uh and then we went and applied it here i mean then you're starting to get to the point where ooh, that we got to scale that shit down that is really extreme uh no sorry that's height map we want this to be tuned way down there we go. And then we've got sort of like bumpy normal effects or something like that. Um, you know, and, and really we'd want a custom shader and do all kinds of things for the planet itself. And there's lots of interesting custom shader stuff for planets available online that you can find. But ultimately, that's that's the sort of thing you're going to want to do um, rather than the way we've got it now. But yeah, so we got the trigger. Okay, let's work on the opposite here because we've got to wrap this up. We're already 13 minutes in or halfway in. The opposite should be fine. So now the question is, we are, when we're on ground mode, we want another button. So... These, um, this bouton here, right over here, uh, let's go to 2D mode, we're going to duplicate this, Doop. Um, and we're going to just move it down here, and so it's not, it shouldn't be called land ship, it should be called something like um, uh, terrain mode, like that, and then this one here is going to be called space mode, there we are, that's what we're going to do, and so this is button Come on, don't highlight everything if I don't want you to. Be like that. Oh, you gotta hit enter to lock it in. I don't know why that is. Boom, enter. There we go. Thank you. And over here, what do we call this train mode, right? So instead of land ship, because we're not actually landing the ship. There you go. Train mode, space mode, like that. Um, in our coordinate manager, so we're gonna have another function that is gonna be called switch. To space and we're gonna do a little check over here as well so if terrain is equal to false 
than already in space mode. So, but we're actually trying to set it to false, right? We are in terrain mode, but we have to switch to space mode. Okay, so we're gonna be doing the inverse of what we're doing here. You know what, why don't we just literally grab all this and then see what we can do. This is interesting. What are the coordinates of the ship relative to the planetoid? Or more importantly, like what is the current latitude and longitude of the ship? Uh, do we have, for a terrain chunk, we have a function for if spherical to local. Do we have a local to spherical? Feels like we should, we must. Um, don't we? Yeah, 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 it's, we don't have a function for it, but we do do it all the time. Yeah, we totally do. Converts a chunk position latitude longitude. Um, that would be pretty easy to do. We've got some sort of public probably, I don't know, um, local to spherical, spherical. Um, so we have some sort of vector three um, local position. So this will return a spherical chord. So this is a position relative to the current chunk, for example, but we could have another variant over here that is like world coordinate to spherical, whoa, and all it's doing is, so world position, is returning the local to spherical, uh, where the world position minus um, this dot transform dot position, like that. That's gonna be okay. So the local to spherical is gonna do something like what? Mm -hmm. Well, when we look at our rotation over here, yeah. grab these. I mean, we don't actually have to catch them here, catch them because we're not in a loop, but let's just make sure we're working the same thing over here. It's fine. Um, so that's each point of the data map thing. All right. We don't have to do this. So this is dividing a point on the data map to a value. So we need, uh, we need to know our zero to one kind of setup. But here, yeah, we're not using the height width map. We're actually gonna be looking at the size. So our local position, there we go. Our local position dot X, we need to um, divide this based on our terrain dot size, I guess terrain data dot size dot X. So our terrain is like 1,024 units wide. Um, so our X position, our local X, we're going to be somewhere, assuming we're on top of the train over here, we're going to be somewhere between zero to 1,024. Um, so we're going to do that. I mean, this gets a little weird if we ask a world position, like warning, this will be weird slash wrong. If you, uh, pass coordinates, um, outside the bounds of this terrain. Things will be weird slash wrong uh, if you do this. Um, so don't. <laughs> All right, so we got that. That's fine. Um, so here, yeah, same thing. So we're going to take our local position. Um, now, this is our local position in the Z world coordinates. Z. All right. Note Z. And then same thing here. Because when we're talking about these vector threes, the Y coordinate is actually height. But now that we've got that... Right, we've got our Y pause, then we can just run this exact same thing over here. So we can take our 
chunk rotation. Uh, half degrees per chunk. So we have degrees per chunk divided by two. Like that. So then we now have a rotation. And we can simply return. Uh, what's it called? Chord helper. Chord helper dot uh, rotation to spherical. So we pass in this point rotation and return that. There we go. So at this point, um, fix me. Do a raycast to determine which um, terrain chunk we are under. Actually, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to offload that to Dynamic Terrain Master. That actually, I, I like that a lot. So Dynamic Terrain Master is going to have some sort of function here. Yeah, because Dynamic Terrain Master knows what all the chunks are, right? So it is actually going to have a public function called World to Spherical. And what it's going to do, or what it's supposed to do, is do a raycast to find which terrain chunk we're under. Uh, we are just going to fake it that we're on the middle chunk. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to return for our min middle chunk. So we have um, terrain chunks object. Our middle chunk is the 1-1 one, one point. And we're going to ask for the world to spherical from this world position. Like that. There we go. So we're just gonna we're just gonna assume the middle chunk just to you know for the purpose of this little tutorial. But raycasting downwards to find what chunk is there is fine. If you raycast downwards and don't find a chunk at all, then it's like okay. So you're asking me for something that's hovering over an area we're not rendering. How do you want to deal with that? Interesting question mark over there. Um, so we've got this good. So we've got these that seems to be relatively implemented, which is okay. So what we want at this point is we are replacing this aspect with our, we've got our terrain. And our terrain has a dynamic chunk master, which I don't think we have to cache here either. So dynamic terrain chunk master dot um, world to spherical. So we're going to take the ships transform dot position like that and put it in there. So um, taking off from coordinates Bam. So we're going to be taking off from somewhere, debugging that. We are going to set the planetoid to true. We're going to set the train to false. And actually what we should be doing at this point to do, um, uh, you, we, we probably, actually, we could have something like this um, rather than just put in two mat chunk thing over here. Let's say we have a public void um, reset chunks or clear. Destroy chunks. I like it. All right, so then what we do to do, destroy game objects, clear, array, etc. All right, this is just what we, we destroy everything when we take off and be ready to land again. Um, so we'd be calling something like the terrain dot get component dot destroy chunks. Boom. Uh, so we don't need to build from landing spot, right? We're doing destroy chunks instead. That's the inverse of that. We want to unrotate ourselves to get back to the frame of reference that we're expecting. We need to uh, fix ourselves from the planet radius. So re-add the radius of the planet. So we're adding the planet radius at this point. Um, we need to uh, divide instead of multiplying boop, of the scale like that. So, and then we have to wire that button because that button's not actually doing anything. So the space mode button, we need to tell you to switch to switch to space. So if we hit play, we're in space over here. We can see it a little bit more clearly if we do this. We've got space. Oh, not in 2D mode. Thank you. We got space. If I hit, um, so if I hit space mode, nothing should happen because we're already in space mode. If I hit terrain mode, freezes for two and a half seconds, generates that, moves the ship over there. Landing ships at coordinate zero, zero. Then if I hit, I want to go back to space mode. 
we are taking off from coordinate zero zero. Um, oh, okay. You can actually still see the train, but that's okay. The big question is where are where's the ship? The ship is not in the right place. Okay, this dynamic train trunk master. Let's go ahead and do this. Um, for uh, x is equal to zero. X is oops. X is less than three. Again, we're hard coding in some stuff here, so we'll fix fix this more better later. Um, destroy terrain chunk x comma y like that. Um, there you go. I'll we'll just do that. You know, we could turn them off or whatever, but still, we have to do this more better. That's not the problem here. I mean, but it was one problem. It looked silly to have the train still in there. But the question is, why doesn't the ship go back to a Z of 1738? Right? Because we hit terrain mode. And we're here. And then we hit space mode. Um... It does fix our rotation, it's worth noting. It didn't actually de destroy the train chunks. I don't think we're actually loading the array properly, but that's okay. Um, right, because it's Y is rotated 180. If we hit terrain mode, then the X is going to be rotated 90 degrees. And if we hit space mode, the rotation definitely gets fixed. It's the scaling that's not correct. Why? Oh, first of all, there, that's probably part of it. I should add the radius of the planet after we fix our scale. I don't know if that's the only problem, but that is true. Because it's adding a radius of a thousand, well, 1700 instead of 1 1.7 million. So terrain mode, space mode. I mean, this is executing. It's taking off, setting the planetoid true, setting the train inactive, which doesn't actually matter, and then calling destroy chunks, which apparently isn't actually destroying the chunks. I don't know, whatever. I don't think this matters, but I'm just going to do this first anyway. Um, yeah, what? It's just during the game objects. No. It's destroying the components. We need to destroy the game objects. That's what's going on. There we go. That'll clear them out. But that doesn't actually resolve this. So we should be going from 8,000 to like 8. Is there something weird that happens when we change the scale? I mean, I don't think so, but just out of curiosity, I'm going to do this. So we're going to go from a position of 8,000 in the Y. Um. Yeah, okay, so we're derotating. So at this point, if I didn't do anything over here, if I didn't do anything, let's, let's do this step by step, even though it's a little bit annoying. And I'm, I'm apologizing that I'm so fail at math. The ship's at a Z of 17,000. We go to train mode. It's now at a Y of 8,000. Or 1,000. That's right, a Y 1,000. When we go back to space mode, it'll rotate. Okay, it's got a Z of 1,000, which is like what is expected but wrong. Um, so we then want to dis uh, divide the position by a thousand because we don't want to be a thousand kilometers above the surface of the planet. We, at that point, are supposed to be one kilometer. So in terrain mode, we're one kilometer above the surface of the planet. In space mode, we're now one kilometer above the surface of the planet. And then we are adding in the normalized, uh, the um, the planet's radius. So we're taking our currently current magnitude, adding in the planet's magnet uh, radius. Okay, let's let's confirm. So now we should be instead of a z of effectively one, we should be at a z of uh, well, we should be back at this or seventeen thirty seven point nine 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 or something like that. So terrain mode into space mode. Oh, 
I'm a derp. Because we're not actually adding this in. Um, so it should be pause divided equals by that. Pause is this, and then the ship dot transform. This is like the most basic error. But that's okay. Basic errors are easy to resolve. Um, and then we'll go and do this bit again, because there's no way this was breaking things. It's that we weren't actually setting the position after the, the radius was added back in. So stop, play, terrain mode. So we're about, we're about a thousand meters above the surface of the ground. Space mode, we're back to a thousand or one kilometer or a thousand meters above the surface of the planet. I mean, we might shift a little as we swap from back and forth, but it's okay. If I hit the train mode again, does it break? No, it works because we're recreating the train chunks. God damn it. I mean, switching to space mode is really easy because, well, first of all, we're only reactivating anything. We don't have to regenerate anything. And of course, the terrain generation is still slow. But that's why in your particular version, first of all, obviously, again, you're not going to have the buttons to toggle modes. What you're going to do is as your ship approaches a planet, at some point, you're going to have some sort of trigger to generate stuff. And the way to do it probably best is as you get closer in another thread, generate the, the correct terrain. And when the terrain is ready to go, that's when you deactivate the sphere and activate the train. And even then, you probably don't do it simultaneously. What you probably do is figure out some system where you take your moon over here um, and your moon's material, uh, which I guess we would modify over here, and um, just start making it uh, transparent. Oh, it's not actually a transparent render mode. Hold on. Render mode, transparent. There we go. So make some, you know, little cloud effects from the atmosphere, maybe some flames, some debris, fade out this and have the terrain in exactly the right place behind it, um, which actually might mean rather than moving, um, when you go to move the ship, actually move the planet as well so that the planet's in the right place for you to do this fade to reveal the other terrain. But you just put a little bit of noise in there to make it more seamless because we're not using, we're not using our terrain procedural system to generate the planet. Um, we're using two separate ones. That way we get to take advantage. Going back to episode one, our particular solution here is set up in such a way that we can take advantage of Unity's built-in train engine and um, avoid us having to reinvent a lot of the wheel and really dramatic. Let us use the built-in physics system much, much more competently than if we were trying to deal with actual round worlds and always having to like change which direction the gravity vector is in and all that. And I mean, there's a lot of stuff when you're on the surface, you just want to use normal coordinate systems where, you know, Y is up. You don't want to always have to be rotating based on what part of the planet you're on, fix the physics all the time and do really, 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 really annoying things, which would just be miserable. And so hopefully that avoids some of that, but there we go. We have a system. Um, again, replace the buttons with some sort of little, little proximity trigger. And all of a sudden you're like in golden shape for I'm now landing on this planet, and I'm in space. And I'm landing on the planet, and I'm in space. Like, don't generation time drop somewhere along the way? Why is it 2.1 instead of whatever it was before? Was not when I was, when I was sitting at 2.3? I don't imagine anything that it would have done that would have made that any faster more recently. I'm not sure. But this is going to be put up on Git. Feel free to um to to clone this make some changes create a new like mighty spud 2.0 engine or something like that the mightiest spud whatever you want to call it um and keep adding you know more awesomeness and more competency to this because this is a good place to start but it's certainly not the end there's a little a few little fix me's and to do's in here um that you can do to tune things um i know that the uh, structures orientation i don't believe is quite right so you can do that there's plenty of space for optimization at some point in the future we could look into how we might um get this to either be implemented as a coroutine or a thread i mean in this case the coroutine advantage the coroutine advantage in this case is that we don't have to deal with the fact that Unity does not like threads when you're manipulating its particular um, data elements. The downside to the coroutine is um, we have to decide where we yield. And I mean, so, I mean, if this were a yield, if this were a coroutine, right? If we did like a yield, is it yield return null or whatever, something like this to like um, free, like pause, um, terrain generation for one frame. 
I mean, if we did this in our inner loop all the time, we'd have something super responsive, but it would take however many times this is supposed to loop, you know, 10,000 times, then it would take 10,000 frames to generate. Your program would never freeze, but it would take forever to do things. So then it's like, okay, well then maybe we move it here. Maybe we accept a little bit of lagginess. Maybe all we do is uh, we yield for a frame um, between each one of these steps. That's an idea. Build terrain, yield, build splats, yield, something like that. Like there's, you know, you have to sort of mess around with this and try to find the right balance of responsiveness and not. Maybe what you could do is wrap it around. Um, you could actually have, if all your functions here are coroutines, you could have some other coroutine function here. What was it? I enumerable or enumerator? I don't remember. But you know, you can see how often I use these freaking coroutines, right? Um, maybe coroutine pause, right? So what you do in your code all the time here, instead of just like yielding null, what you do is you, um, I was going to say you yield to this. I suppose you could either yield to this or you could do like an if maybe. So this could be a Boolean, you know, coroutine should pause, right? And then what you have um, in here, so if coroutine should pause, uh, then what you do is you do the uh, yield return null. So you stick that inside of your loop, right? And then what you do in here is you have some sort of stopwatch. Imagine we have a system.diagnostics.stopwatch um, coroutine stopwatch like this. Um, so first, if coroutine stopwatch is equal to null, then we create the new one um, is equal to new and coroutine stopwatch.start. And we assume it's not time to pause. So return false. Um, and then we do something like uh, if coroutine stopwatch dot elapsed milliseconds. So we do something like um, float uh, coroutine limit is equal to, I don't know, uh, 0 0.033. So um, never slower than uh, 30 FPS while genning terrain. You know, or we're on PC, maybe we want better than that, but you know, something like that. So then you do something here, like if elapsed milliseconds is greater than coroutine limit, then what we do is we, first of all, we'd reset the stopwatch. Dot reset. Um, does it start again on a reset? That actually I don't know. So we might have to still do start. I don't know if you still do or if this is um, redundant, but let's do that. And then return true that it's time to pause. Otherwise we return false. And so then you have a system where your coroutine is only yielding if we've taken more than one thirtieth of a second to process to date. So you have something like that. And then, so then you've got a mix of, we're going to try to do as much work per frame as possible, but we're going to try to keep the system relatively responsive. So what you would do is you would have your, your build terrain, build terrain data. Like you'd have all these things all set as coroutines that would just keep sort of, um, well, I guess you just have the master one called that. No, these functions would also have to be coroutines and then chain. I guess this wouldn't have to be the coroutine. You just call each one of these as a coroutine or, or something like that. You'd, you'd figure out your sort of strategy. So this is like um, example helper function to help manage uh, coroutine um, yields to balance between terrain generation speed and program responsiveness, responsiveness, like that. And the nice thing about this, no loading screens. That's what's beautiful about this. I mean, that, that 2.5 second pause we're working, this, working with is effectively a 2.5 second long loading screen is effectively what we're dealing with before. But if you do something like this, then you just skip that loading screen. There's like, you know, a couple of seconds of, of judder or maybe really not any if you decide to like drop this down. So this is like, uh, there we go, 100 FPS or something, what is it, 1.6? So something like 60 FPS? Never slower than 60 FPS while genning terrain? Obviously, this would cause the terrain generation to take a lot longer. 10, 20, 30 seconds, depending on, on things. That, that's why like the balance becomes important. Um, I think something like this is okay. So you're just pausing for one frame um, every 33 milliseconds, 
and then you are probably you might you might double or triple or quadruple the terrain generation time, but no no stutters in your code keeps running perfectly fine and that's okay and again you know you keep so you keep at that point you keep showing them the old planet graphic that's also when you do whoosh, whooshy cloud stuff as you're coming in and then it you know then it generates and then there's probably tons of room still for optimizing all this and it's worth noting if you did a multi-threaded thing um you still you would maybe be able to generate stuff a little bit faster than with the coroutines it would certainly balance out your cpu load a hell of a lot better and actually you'd be able to use multiple cores a lot more effectively but there's um there would be a lot of extra overhead due to the fact that you would have to pre-copy a lot of the data from like the terrain and stuff like that you'd have to pre-copy because you can't access terrain data in a separate thread you can't access anything from texture in a separate thread. So you'd have to copy all the pixels, all the train data, all that kind of stuff into separate arrays, have your um, your thread work on those arrays, and then after the thread is done, put the, that array data back into the real um, train data, the real textures and things. Um, and that extra overhead may not save you time. In fact, it might be slower. It also will generate a lot of garbage collection requests. So the core routine avoids that, but with the, the caveat that it's you're still running single threads, so you don't get to maybe utilize as much of the horsepower. So that, that'll that be a question for balancing for, you know, in real life. And it's very much going to depend on the scope of the game um, and what kind of thing you're trying to implement because you, may, because you may have more or less complex terrains, you may have more or less complex space stuff. Obviously, everything's been set up here for a single planet, but you can easily adapt this to a multiple planet situation. You would just need, you'd mostly need a smarter um, coordinate manager right over here, right? Like, to do, um, implement, implement a system whereby the planetoid gets set to whatever planet, moon, etc. you are actually closest to. That goes ditto to the, um, uh, the UI coordinate display, right? Because it has the, the parent object. So we could put in a little note. Same same exact note. Whereby parent object gets set to whatever planet, moon, etc. you're actually closest to. This is going to wrap up our work on Project Mighty Spud. What a fun... And I say fun with sort of like italics in there because... Math was hard, but very satisfying. Very satisfying, I feel, what we accomplished. I gotta say, this is probably the project where I've had to rely on the most. Oops. Of course, I make a glitch right here at the end. Oh, little F there. Um, the most feedback from people who caught a lot of, um, of little math issues here and there helped me work out some of the logic with some of the coordinate systems. Um, oh, yeah, one of the to-dos is still there's, like, slight seams over here, but it's mostly like floating point stuff and just the slightest distortion that happens at the edges. The fact that they're so minuscule though makes me feel really confident about just deciding to like greatly expand this. Um, I just realized you are not spawning in the right place because almost certainly you, because you're supposed to spawn there, um, there's a, you know when we fixed, when we fixed always amazing to find more bugs here when we fixed spherical to rotation by putting that negative here which fixed the uh, the terrain um, apparently something in our building code right uh, was it build structures something in here is not properly using that I think there might need a little negative sign here Let me do this. I think that might be the case. Uh, terrain mode. It was working fine before we inverted the other bit. Uh, nope. Oh. Here? Now you're just gone. But you're supposed to be here, right? Hmm, um, exercise to the viewer? Maybe. This video's gone on way too long. So I just removed that. So I'm back to, like, the original error. 
Yeah, the building's spawning here. It's supposed to spawn here. It's probably not supposed to be negative. It's probably supposed to be something like 1 minus y. Where's the y coming from? From over here. Let's try that. Terrain mode? Arg. Okay. Well, my brain space is not here. There's, um... Uh... Fix me! Uh, yeah, it's... Okay, you know what? I'm, it is the... It is the latitude. UV to spherical. No, the UVs... What's the deal here? Alright, listen, I'm just gonna put in a fix me. Fix me! Since we fixed, um... Cord helper... Uh, dot that. Dot this. Um, the building is now spawning at the wrong... Oh, yeah, it's like, it's just the wrong rotation. It's not this, it's... Oh, you know, I'm wondering about UV to spherical. That's probably exactly it. It's probably in here. Try this. Again, I'm sort of just throwing random shit at the wall here, and that's probably not the right way to go things. But it's going to be some... There it is. I was going to say, it's going to be something that simple. There it is. Now the building's back in the right place. Okay. Um, do note, there might be a few more of those. UV to rotation, almost certainly there needs to be a negative marker there. Oh, oh I don't like making these changes now. Um, terrain mode? Did that break anything? I don't even know if we're using that function. That's actually a good question. Is anyone using this function? Mm, find references. The answer is no. But if they had been, it would have been wrong. Okay, I think we fixed all those. Oh, thank goodness. Okay, so now the building's right. I'm going to stop now. Thank you very much for watching, folks. The next videos are going to be dealing with some Ludum Dare prep. As well as, actually, I think we might do a video revisiting some hex tile things. So stay tuned for that. Thank you very much for supporting what was a really, really satisfying project. Really difficult in places, but very cool. See you next time, folks. Bye-bye. Thank you to all our April Patreon supporters and these mic check supporters. We've got Harry Hendel. We've got Yuko Finn, Snoopy TRB, Tiburon, Pavels Danov, Drazion, Gavin Power, Michael McClintock, Aaron Teubson, Greg Mortel, The Not So Evil Engineer, Julien Auger Lafont, Maris Fieldvold, Speedy Savant, Steven Stagger, Valiant Cake Fiend, Jason Yanity, Steven Bonnerman, Kale the Quick, and Neil Blakey Milner, and everyone who's watched, shared, favorited, and subscribed to these videos. Thank you so, so much.